And now to today's presentation. We are pleased to have Jennifer Hay joining us as our presenter. Jennifer is a factory application scientist with Agilent Technologies and has worked in the field of micro-mechanical testing since 1996. She has written a number of articles on the subject, including a feature series in the journal Experimental Techniques. And it looks like we're ready to begin. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Jennifer Hagg. You may begin, Jennifer. Well, thank you, Joan. Uh, thank you for hosting us once again. And I want to extend my warmest welcome to everybody in our virtual audience today. This is the fourth installment in an ongoing series on instrumented indentation that happens on the first Wednesday of each month. Of course, all these sessions are recorded, so if you are just now joining us, uh, then you can certainly watch those earlier sessions to get caught up. So where are we headed? Um, I did get this question in the last session. Uh, the question was, you've given us all these elastic contact models. What should I use? Love, Nedden, Hurt, Hay, Bolshakov, and Farr? Um, so the answer to that question is, when we get to the point of interpreting physical indentation data, I will be very clear about what model to use. Uh, but until we get there, I want to provide a foundation so you can understand why a particular model is employed for a particular situation, and also the limitations of the model as dictated by the assumptions or simplifications behind it. So we are going to get there. Um, OK, believe it or not, this is our last session on elastic contact mechanics. Um, and so before finishing today, I plan to bring together everything from the last two sessions. Uh, so let's briefly review. Um, OK, so in session two, we took a close look at uh, Snedden's solution to the Bucinex problem. We saw that, in general, elastic contact theory proposes a rational relationship between force, mutual approach, which we also call displacement, and elastic properties. And in 1965, Ian Snedden proposed a generalized elastic contact theory governing semi-infinite axisymmetric bodies in elastic contact. And we saw that for all contacts governed by Sen's theory, uh, there was a very simple relationship between the stiffness, the reduced modulus, and the contact radius A. All right, so last session, uh, last month's session three, we saw that there is a slight problem in that the, the uh, problem that Snedden articulated is not identical to that of simulated or physical indentation. And in fact, real and simulated contact yield profiles that are broader than predicted by Snedden's analysis. Um, and we saw that if we naively use Snedden's analysis to interpret indentation data, the calculated modulus is larger than the true modulus. Um, but we did find a resolution to that problem, we modeled force displacement data from indentation of a rigid cone into a uniform flat elastic half space with this relationship. The stiffness, we still have the general, same general form, stiffness is equal to two times the reduced modulus times the contact radius, but we also have this factor gamma, um, where gamma is essentially unity, but it is modified um, by this term, which depends on the Poisson's ratio of the test material and also um, the half-included angle of the indenter. And so it, does, it depends both on material properties and it depends um, on geometry. And we saw that um, this, the, the value of gamma could be anywhere from 1 up to something um, as great as 25%, uh, uh, 1.25 for something like a um, con uh, um, a very sharp indenter with a with a half included angle of like uh, 30 degrees. So um, uh, all right, uh, and we found that the factor gamma was obtained by modifying the geometry so that the resulting spin profile approximated the original punch profile. Okay, so today. We are going to press that a little bit further because we know from session two that paraboloid or Hertzian um, uh, 
and conical indentations are both special cases of NIMS general solution. So the hertz and the cone, uh, uh, the paraboloid and the cone are both special cases of NIMS general solution. And so if a correction for radial displacements is required for conical indentation, then we should expect to need a correction for paraboloid indentation as well. And this was published um, by myself and a colleague, uh, Paul Wolf. We employed the very same tactics as Hay, Bolshoff, Koff, and Farr to derive a gamma factor for Hertzian context. And you can see uh, the citation information down here. And finally, before we wrap up today, we'll see that a side-by-side -side comparison of the two corrections, the two gamma factors, leads to a general correction for all contacts governed by SNMs analysis. Okay, on the left here, I'm showing the geometry for today. We have two elastic bodies in contact, body one and body two. You can think of body one as the sample and body two as the indenter. In general, the function f of r describes the separation distance between the two bodies when they are just in contact. Um, but for today, we're only thinking about a paraboloid in contact with a flat surface. So I've drawn f of r as a parabola. As a parabola. And so body two is obtained by revolving f of r about the axis of symmetry. Okay, here are our boundary conditions, and if you were with us uh, last time, uh, these should be very familiar by now. Uh, now, remember what we're after today is a relatively small modification to Hertzian contact theory, so right away I'm going to go ahead and neglect deformation in body two, which we're thinking about as a dinner, just because it greatly simplifies the analysis um, in the whole picture. Although, generally, you don't want to neglect the deformation from the inventor, it turns out that for the purposes of deriving a small correction, this isn't a problem. Um, hopefully, that will become evident as we press on. So, we are neglecting deformation in the inventor, but only for the purpose of deriving this small correction. So, this first boundary condition simply states that points on the surface are constrained to move down by an amount equal to h less the original separation distance f of r. This second boundary condition expresses the fact that there are no surface tractions outside the contact radius, and the third boundary condition expresses that there is no tangential stress at the surface. In other words, there's no friction between the two bodies. Now, what's important, what's important to note here is that the boundary conditions prescribe no constraints on the radial motion of points on the surface of body one. All that's prescribed here are axial displacements, and um, believe it or not, that has implications for us, just, just as we saw last time. Okay, so what deformation results from these boundary conditions? To illustrate the answer, I'm showing specific points on the surface of body one. Um, okay, so at this point that we have pictured here, the two bodies have just come into contact right here. Um, the problem is that when these two bodies are pressed together, we unjustly impose our physical concept on Snedden's and Hertz's map and presume that the deformed surface looks like this, right? We press a rigid punch into the surface of body one, and body one conforms to the shape of the punch. Well, in fact, this is what happens physically, but the picture I have on this slide is mathematically incorrect. Uh, mathematically, Hertzian analysis tells us that the deformed surface looks like this. Points on the surface, have indeed moved down by the prescribed amount, but they have also moved radially inward. And there's nothing in Snowden's boundary conditions that prohibits this radial movement. Um, but this radial motion is physically appropriate. When you really indent with a rigid indenter, the contact surface doesn't move in like this. 
So the problem is that Hertz's expressions for force and displacement are true only for this black profile. His expressions for force and displacement are not strictly appropriate for indentation with a rigid indenter, which I've represented here with the gray profile. And that's our problem. So what happens if you use a commercial finite element solver like ANSYS or Abacus to simulate Hertzian indentation? When you do a finite element simulation of indentation of a rigid punch into an elastic half space, you provide as input the elastic properties of the sample, the elastic modulus and the Poisson's ratio and the indenter shape. With this information, uh, the finite element solver does its thing and spits out a uh, force displacement curve. Now, we can analyze this force displacement curve according to Hertzian theory. For example, uh, we can calculate the reduced modulus using the Hertzian force displacement relationship. Um, and, and this equation here is just the, the equation that we derived in session two solved for the reduced modulus. So we could use this Hertzian relationship to deduce the reduced modulus from the simulated force displacement data. And from this reduced modulus, we can calculate the sample modulus, and we can compare this output modulus to that which we use as an input to the simulation. And if you do this, and I recommend that you do this, uh, what you will find is that the output of Young's modulus is significantly greater than the input value. So we put in a value of, say, 100, and by, by the time we go through this whole loop, um, the, the modulus that you get back the other end might be 105, say. And of course, the problem is that we are applying Hertzian analysis to a problem that Hertz didn't actually solve. When we do a finite element simulation with a commercial package, we get this gray profile, but we naively interpret the output of the simulation with expressions that were derived for this black profile. Now, it's pretty easy to see that the force required to achieve this broader gray profile is greater than the force required to uh, achieve Sen's profile. So if we put the force required to achieve the gray profile into this expression, which is for the black profile, then the modulus that we calculate is going to be too large because P is too large for this expression. We got P from the gray profile, but the expression is for the black profile. So. Uh, just like we did last week, we asked whether the Hertzian analysis can be modified so that it is appropriate for a truly rigid paraboloid, a uh, truly rigid punch. Um, now, I want to point out that I'm using, uh, using the word rigid punch, um, and that's a, uh, some people, I think, have the misunderstanding that this, these inward radial displacements occur because, you know, um, you know, uh, true punches are not totally rigid, um, uh, and that's not that's not the case. This inward radial displacement is not physical, even if you're using something like diamond or carbide steel. Okay, this this inward radial displacement is mathematical. Um, it, it comes from Hertzian analysis and boundary conditions that, that he imposed, uh, which are the same conditions that Sen used. Okay, so these these radial displacements are not physical; they're mathematical. Physically, the profile, the surface profile, looks like this gray line. Okay, but we want to use we want to use this Hertzian analysis to understand our force displacement data. Um, and so, yes, we can um, uh, we can fix it if we take the same approach as Hable, Chapoff, and Farr and adjust the initial geometry so that the final geometry matches what we get from the Hertzian analysis, um, at least at the edge of contact. Okay, so let's look at the solution for paraboloid. 
here we have our profile, f of r, which defines the parabola, uh, parabola. You can think of this capital R as the radius of the sphere which the paraboloid approximates. And actually, if you, if you do a second order Taylor expansion of the equation for the bottom half of a circle of radius r, you in fact get this expression for a parabola. So although it's not strictly right um, to call r the radius, uh, because we're talking about a paraboloid, that's what we're going to do. We're going to think about r as the radius of this curve, uh, the radius of this curve. Okay, so this is our profile f of r. But Hurstian analysis results in a profile that looks something like this due to inward radial displacement. So what if we start with a curve with a slightly larger included radius, okay, shown with the red line here, so that we end up with a final profile that approximates our original curve f of r. And that final profile is this dashed red line here. All right, so that's our approach. That's the approach we're going to take to modify the Hertzian force displacement relationship so that it is appropriate for truly rigid inventors. All right, so what is exactly the radial displacement for which we have to compensate? Well, um, I have to tell the truth here. I did not work this out for myself. At the time I was thinking about this problem, I happened to find the very expression I needed uh, for Hertzian radial displacement in Ken Johnson's classic, uh, classic text on contact mechanics. Um, so this is the expression for the surface radial displacement of a Hertzian contact. Um, but what we really want to know is the value of this expression at the edge of contact where R is equal to A. Um, and you can see when R is equal to A, then this just becomes 1. Uh, 1 minus 1 is 0. It doesn't matter that it's raised to the 3 halves. So everything in the brackets here just reduces to 1. And so we are left with, when we evaluate this expression at R equals A, uh, we're left with this expression here. Uh, note that the negative sign here indicates that the displacement is radially inward. So the next step is to find an expression for the modified radius that does what we need. Um, so it actually doesn't matter um, uh, which curve we're talking about here. Uh, we have this relationship uh, between the inventor radius and the contact radius and the displacement. We actually derived this expression uh, in session two, and it holds true uh, for our original f of r as well as our modified f of r. Okay, so we get our modified radius by adding the magnitude of the expected radial displacement to the Hertzian contact radius A. Okay, remember that U of R is actually negative, so when we subtract a negative number, we're actually um, just adding the magnitude. Okay, so here's our expression for uh, radial displacement at, um, at the edge of contact. Okay, so we're going to take this expression and plug it in here, and we're going to do some simplification, and we're going to find that our modified radius is equal to this expression, okay? Then we notice that this a squared uh, over h is just our original radius. So we just substitute radius in for a squared over h in order to get our final expression for the modified radius in terms of the original radius. Okay, so this is the radius that we want to use in our Hertzian force displacement relationship to make up for the fact that mathematically we know there are going to be some inward radial displacements. So here's the original Hertzian force displacement relation. We apply this relation to a curve with a slightly larger radius uh, by substituting our expression for the modified radius in for the radius here. Okay, so uh, we're going to use the modified radius 
in our hurricane force displacement relationship, and when we actually make this substitution, um, we find that when we do that and simplify, we get an expression that looks an awful like, like our original force displacement relation, except that it has this little factor gamma, where gamma is equal to um, this expression here. And that's basically just the expression inside uh, uh, the parentheses here, because when we take this whole expression and plug it in for r uh, square root of r, um, uh, of course, we get the square root of r here, and then we take the square root of this, and that just, you know, becomes what's inside the parentheses here, and that's our gamma factor. That's where the gamma factor comes from. Okay, so now let's look at how this gamma factor comes through in this stiffness uh, equation. So beginning with our modified force displacement relation, we take the derivative of force with respect to displacement, which gives us this expression here. And again, remembering that we have this relationship uh, between indenter radius, contact radius, and displacement, and substituting a squared over r, uh, uh, a squared over h, and for r here, uh, that gives us um, uh, this expression for stiffness in terms of contact radius, which is just like the general Snedden relation discovered by Oliver Farm Blossom, except for this little factor gamma, uh, which again for hurricane contact is this. Okay, so we have uh, the form of our stiffness equation is intact, uh, but we have this little correction factor gamma, which is given by this expression. All right. Uh, so let's take a closer look at gamma. So what we've done in this session today is we have um, seen that the basic form of our stiffness equation holds uh, for parabola and dinner, except for this factor gamma, which is given by this expression. So we saw last time uh, that for a conical in dinner, again, uh, the same basic form of the stiffness equation holds, uh, but we do have this factor gamma, and this factor gamma is not the same as this factor gamma. So although these look identical, they're actually not because we have different, slightly different definitions of gamma uh, here. But let's look at this defini these definitions of gamma more closely. Uh, first, I would point out um, that they are both uh, modifications of unity, okay? So we are adding something to one. So both of them start with one, okay? Both of them have the same functionality with respect to Poisson's ratio, okay, 1 minus 2 nu or 1 minus nu. And then if you actually look at the value of these constants here, uh, for a paraboloid indenter, it's 0.212, and for a conical indenter, it's 0.25. So even the value of the constants is very close. Um, so the final thing that we should look at is this factor A over R and this factor of cotangent of the half included angle. Okay, um, let's go back to our original function f of r. Uh, f of r is r squared over 2r for a uh, paraboloid. Okay, if we take the derivative of that function and evaluate it at uh, the radius of contact, that's what gives us a over r. In other words, a over r is um, just the slope of the shape of the inventor at the edge of contact. Um, and I wasn't the first one to come up with this. Um, uh, Tabor and Ken Johnson and all, um, they all point out that, um, in fact, that this is uh, the best way to think about the strain of the inventor, and we'll get to that later. Um, uh, so I wasn't, I wasn't all that clever here. Um, I did know from the other literature that A over R is just the derivative of F of R evaluated as a radius of contact uh, for a paraboloid indenter. And actually the same thing for a conical indenter. Here the function is R cotangent to the half included angle. And if you ha uh, take the derivative of that, uh, of course you get cotangent of uh, the half included angle and it's a constant. It doesn't matter that you evaluate it at R equals A. Um, it, it's uh, the slope 
the slope is a constant for a conical indenter, and this is its value. So whether you're talking about a paraboloid or a conical indenter, in either case, gamma depends on the slope of the indenter at the edge of contact. And so the only real difference between these two expressions is the value of the constant here. And actually, that value is very close. Okay, It's about one-fourth uh, in either case. So um, I propose a general expression for gamma uh, that has this form, uh, one-fourth, the same functionality with respect to plus balance ratio. And um, the derivative of uh, this function, which describes the shape of the indenter, evaluated at the edge of contact. Now, um, I have to say that, that both of these expressions are published. This expression is published. This expression is published. This expression is not published because I can't really, you know, I can't really justify it any better than I've done today. You know, you just look at the two expressions side by side, you say, well, you know, those are both the same if we just use a, a constant coefficient here of one-fourth. Um, but I have used this expression for 10 years now um, in analyzing simulated um, indentation data, so indentation data that's simulated by means of finite element analysis. And this, this general expression always gives me an output modulus um, <clears throat> that matches the input modulus to within 1%. Um, if, if the simulation is elastic. Um, uh, in fact, for a while, uh, I was investigating using cut-shaped indenters. Um, I don't know how well this is going to come through on the, on the presentation, uh, but a cut-shaped indenter is basically um, uh, an inverted parabola. So you might have something like this, okay, that is uh, um, a con, uh, con, uh, concave curvature to the indenter, okay? And this expression worked just fine there. You can also see that it will work for a uh, flat-ended punch, okay, because um, at least the one-sided derivative uh, for a flat punch, f of r is zero, uh, so the derivative is zero, um, uh, at least up until the edge of contact, and so this whole thing goes to zero, and gamma is just one, which we would expect for a punch. So this is what I use all the time when analyzing simulated indentation data of elastic contact. Um, now, I'll get to why I make that um, exclusion in just a minute. Um, uh, so we're about to wrap up our session on, on uh, contact, elastic contact mechanics, and I want to point out two loose ends. Um, and of course, the first loose end is just what I talked about. Um, there is no general expression uh, for gamma um, uh, there's no general expression in the literature for gamma. Um, uh, what I use is, is just what I use. Um, and the reason there's no general expression for gamma in the literature is that there is no general expression for radial displacement in terms of f of r. Uh, we, for a cone, we just grabbed it out of this book, and for a parabola, we just grabbed it out of this book. I think a great research project um, for someone who, who's got some mathematical depth and some experience in mechanics would be to derive a general expression for U of R in terms um, uh, for radial displacement in terms of F of R. And I think we need to a general expression for um, gamma in terms of F of R. I think that would be an, a very interesting tact to take. So of course, by loose end number one, I mean research opportunity number one, OK? <laughs> Loose end number two is how does plasticity affect gamma, okay? So this expression, or something very close to it, is true for all contacts uh, governed by SENS analysis, and that's what I'm alleging today. Uh, you know, this may not be exactly right, but this is going to be very close to right, okay? Um, However, in practice, this expression is only employed when analyzing um, uh, simulations, elastic simulations. And the reason, um, when, when analyzing experimental data, uh, we set gamma equal to 1. And the reason for that is not that this expression doesn't hold when elasticity 
is recovery from previous plasticity. Okay, um, I'm not saying that this expression doesn't hold when there's plasticity. I think it does hold. The problem is that plasticity makes it very difficult to determine F of R and thus the right value of gamma. And I want to illustrate what I'm talking about here. Okay, so here we have uh, what we think is the right expression for gamma, okay, in terms of uh, F of R. So if this situation came about from an elastic indentation, then this is what the recovered picture would look like. So we press the indenter in. When we withdraw it, we get this picture, okay? So the elastic, um, uh, the unloaded curve is elastic, okay? So when we withdraw the indenter, uh, we get elastic recovery. And because um, all of the deformation was elastic, um, the recovered picture just looks like the starting picture. And so F of R is just, um, you know, the original separation distance between the two bodies in contact, uh, the indenter and the sample. But if this situation is the result of significant plasticity, then when we withdraw the indenter, the recovered picture does not look like the original picture. The recovered picture looks like this. And this is the picture to which we are applying our elastic analysis. In other words, um, I, I know I'm getting a little bit of myself here, but we apply elastic contact mechanics to the data which are acquired when we withdraw the indenter, to the unloading data, okay? And the unloading data are, if, there, if, if that follows, significant plasticity, then this is actually the right elastic picture, okay? So the function F of R, even though this is still an elastic picture, the function F of R is the separation distance between the two bodies as they were, as they have been previously plastically deformed. Um, and so if this is the um, the elastic situation that we need to consider, then actually that is equivalent to something like this, okay, um, where F of R is equivalent to a flat body and a paraboloid punch. Um, and in, if, in fact, if the plasticity is extreme, okay, if you have a, a situation like this, and when you withdraw the indenter, you get almost no elastic recovery, then the effective indenter is actually a flat punch, okay? Because there is no separation distance. If this is the elastic picture we want to consider, then there is no separation distance between the indenter and the material, okay? So in that case, F of R would be zero, uh, F prime of R would be zero, and gamma would be just one, okay? <clears throat> okay, so in general, the function F of R depends on the degree of plasticity. Um, we are still considering elastic contact, but they are elastic contact um, for which the geometry comes about due to prior plasticity, okay? And when plasticity is prior, the function F of R depends on the degree of, of plasticity. The shape, the shape of the contact depends on the degree of plasticity. That's all we're saying here. Okay. Uh, so there is some current research uh, which involves determining F of R for plastic indentation. And this is also uh, called determining the effective indenter. And we actually had an e-seminar recently on this topic. Um, uh, Benoit uh, Merle gave a presentation uh, in this menu on this um, uh, paper, which he published in the Journal of Materials Research, and it was about a method for getting F of R uh, when um, the elastic analysis uh, succeeds previous plasticity. Um, I thought this was a really great start. Um, it's not something that we can readily implement right away uh, because um, the technique involved uh, using some hardware that not everybody has. Uh, it involved using the continuous stiffness measurement technique, um, which um, uh, I haven't gone into uh, uh, 
in, in this series, but some of you may know what I'm talking about. Um, so this is, a tech, this is hardware and software that not everybody has. If we come up with a general way for predicting F of R or the effective inventor, um, we want to use hardware and software that everybody has. So, uh, so in summary, I believe these expressions to be true for every contact governed by SNEN's analysis. This is the right expression for the reduced modulus, and this is the right expression for gamma. However, um, okay, so the above expressions apply for all elastic contacts governed by SNEN's analysis, even if the elasticity is recovered from a plastic indentation. Even when the elasticity is recovered from a plastic indentation, I still think these are true, okay? Um, for purely elastic contact, F of R is very easily ascertained because it's just the, uh, basically it's just the shape of the indenter, assuming that the test surface is flat, okay? Uh, for contacts which manifest elastic recovery, um, F of R is not, uh, which contacts which manifest elastic recovery from prior plasticity, F of R is not easily ascertained, and that's the problem. Um, so it, following the philosophy of first do no harm, presently we set gamma equal to one when interpreting experimental data. And you can see this in our software. However, uh, this is where the loose end is. This may change in the future if F of R or the effective indenter can be accurately modeled for plastic contact. Um, and so uh, that's, that's, I'd really like to see somebody work on that too. All right, um, so, so that about wraps it up for this session. Uh, the next session will actually be in February. We're going to skip January, uh, the beginning of January, but actually it falls on January 2nd. I don't think anybody's going to be interested in coming on that day. So, uh, so the next session will be on uh, the first Wednesday of February, February 6th, uh, 2013. We're going to move on to um, uh, the topic of um, plasticity and how we model that. Um, so here's the abstract, design and analysis of instrumented indentation experiments require knowing the threshold and locus for the onset of plasticity. In this session, we use the Tresca criteria to understand the onset of plasticity for both Hertzian and conical indentations. For Hertzian indentation, the onset of plasticity depends on the applied load, indenter geometry, and material properties. Um, because conical indentation is self-similar, the onset of plasticity actually depends only on indenter geometry and material properties, not applied load. And that's something that surprises a lot of people. So uh, if you want to register for that session, the link is given here. Um, here's my suggested reading for the next session. It's just a couple pages in Ken Johnson's book, Context Mechanics. All right. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And we would like to thank you, Jennifer, for a very informative presentation. Before we move to the Q&A session, we do ask that you complete a short polling survey concerning today's presentation. While the poll is optional, we appreciate you taking the time to answer each question. The poll is now open on the lower right side of your console, and we thank you for completing the survey. While the audience is working through that, I would like to offer a reminder that following the seminar, you will be receiving an email with the recording link for today's event, as well as a PDF copy of the presentation. And uh, Jenny, if you can do me a favor and check to see in your chat box if you received any questions privately during the event, so we make sure we capture uh, everything. I do not have any questions in my chat box. Okay, terrific. Thank you. So now we'll go ahead and move to the question and answer portion concerning the presentation. You may ask questions at any time by putting them in the question box. We will answer them in order. If you would like to ask a question over the phone line, press star and then one on your touchtone phone and the operator will open your line. If your question has already been answered or if you wish to remove yourself from the queue, press the pound key. So to start off with, uh, the first question we have is for Amphiotropic materials, what poisons do we use? OK, 
Okay, so the question is, for anisotropic materials, that's materials that have different elastic properties depending on direction, uh, what Poisson's ratio do we use um, in calculating uh, the uh, elastic modulus or Young's modulus of the material from the reduced modulus? Um, and I, the way I would answer that question is it probably doesn't matter. Um, uh, of course, it depends on the degree of anisotropy, but one of the things um, that I'll show later in another session is that if you do a sensitivity analysis of, maybe I can find it here. Um, Um, if you do a sensitivity analysis of this expression, in other words, if you ask how sensitive is the sample modulus to an uncertainty in Poisson's ratio, what you'll find is that it is pretty insensitive. This functionality is pretty insensitive. Um, you, can, you can have a Poisson's ratio of 0.25 plus or minus 0.1 at that um, that degree of uncertainty in the Poisson's ratio only manifests as a 5% uncertainty in um, the sample module, so the Young's module. Uh, so probably, um, uh, probably it doesn't matter if, if it's extreme anisotropy, um, uh, then that's a, that's a much more difficult question. There's no, uh, none of the models that I've presented thus far would handle that situation. I would probably then move to, um, uh, trying to understand my experimental data through finite element simulations. In other words, I would set up finite element simulations um, uh, where, um, you know, 3D simulation where you could actually model, um, you know, you can input uh, the different elastic properties in each direction and, um, uh, you know, modif mod see what the sensitivity is in that way. That, that's the approach I would take. But probably the short answer is it just doesn't matter. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I do want to quickly check with Howard to see if anyone is holding on the telephone lines. I'm sure no audio questions at this time, yeah? Okay, thank you. Another question that's come in is, is there criteria to determine the size of the material being indented? Um, and there's a follow-up question to this, uh, Jenny, is how sensible is Snedden's solution to size scales? Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Snedden's solution assumes semi-infinite bodies in both directions, the semi-infinite indenter and the semi-infinite sample. Um, and, and um, of course, no real sample matches that assumption, um, uh, so the question is, you know, is, is the material, are the materials large enough to be considered semi-infinite? Um, and, um, you know, the, an the answer to that actually, you know, depends on what goes on beyond, you know, beyond the border. Um, usually this question, though, has to do with, you know, um, thin films, okay? Uh, there's a rule of thumb is about 5%. You want to keep the indentation depth less than 5%, but even that depends on the discrepancy in the properties. Uh, one of the things that I'm uh, definitely going to address in another session are specific models, um, uh, specific models for handling film substrate interaction. In other words, say you have film, you know what the thickness is, you know what the properties of the substrate are, you do an indentation, you get a force displacement curve, how do you model the influence of the substrate so that you get out the properties of the film? Um, and there's definitely good good work out there on that, um, but uh, that's not something that we can get into today. So I would say, you know, right now the short answer to that question is um, uh, you want to keep, um, if you're using a, a Berkovich endeavor, you want to keep indentation depth uh, less than 5% of the film thickness in order to have something like uh, substrate independent measurement. Um, but the fact is, you know, Snedden's solution is really is for uh, semi-infinite bodies, so um, uh, every real situation is something of a compromise to that theory. 
Okay, thank you so much. It does appear that there are no further questions. Uh, so with that, please join me in thanking Jennifer Hay for her presentation today. On behalf of the Electronic Measurement Group, we thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you at a future e-seminar. We will leave the question box open for a few more minutes to receive any feedback or additional questions, but we are now going to close the audio line. Thank you once again for attending. From Agilent Technologies, we wish you a good day.